Father, we thank you once more that we can call you Father. And we know what it means because Jesus said it's his Father too. We thank you that that means Jesus is our brother. And although we'll never be divine and we can't be God, because he's human, he's our brother in his humanity. Bless us now as we look at some of the thoughts you have left for us to understand what communion really is about. We thank you for sharing with us now in Jesus' precious name. Amen. There's a nice convenient place in uh, 5 BC that deals with some of the important things that Alan White said concerning communion. I say convenient because it's all right there. You don't have to go looking all over the library. It's in 5 BC, 1138. So if you want to go back later and see it more in a more comprehensive state, we're just going to touch on a few thoughts. She begins, at least they begin her compilation, by talking about the graft. Now, we all know that a graft is no good all by itself. The branch that is, it has to be grafted to the, to the stalk, to the vine. And we also know how that works. The branch only gets an advantage if it takes. There's got to be a connection. It begins growing on the vine. And it, that growth means the life is coming from the vine to the branch. It's not going from the branch to the vine. It comes from the vine. And the life of that Vine itself is what gives life to the branch, and so the branch and the vine become one thing. Now, we know all that in the natural world, but Jesus has given us that example to show us that is just the way it works in the spiritual life, that we wandering around by ourselves are dead. But if we become engrafted, to him, his life, literally, not just in a thinking, an idea way, but in an actual, literal way, not as a metaphor, like origin and theologians want to make it, but in an actuality that our life becomes attached and connected to his life, that we are not giving him anything, he's giving us his life. And his life literally flows through us to give us life that we didn't have before. So when she says the graft, by its, before the graft, this, this little branch didn't bear any kind of fruit because it was dead. But then something happens, fiber by fiber, vein by vein, See, that connection is real. It, the, this, this little branch partakes of the life of that vine. And that's what the communion service is all about. We're trying to understand what the communion is and what the symbols of the bread and the wine are trying to tell us and what actually happens. And I don't think we understand it yet. Luther might have been closer to it than we understand. Everybody criticizes Luther because Luther said the bread is the body of Christ. And they say, oh, see, that's Roman Catholicism. He couldn't give it up. But maybe Luther's knew something we haven't figured out yet. He didn't do that as a Catholic. He did that as a Christian. And I'm not going to discuss that theologically today, but I want you to see what Alan White says. It gives some very good clues about the vine, 
and the branch and the connection. <laughs> See? So let's go from there. She says, being made a partaker of the life and the nourishment of the living vine by being grafted into the vine, by being brought into the closest relationship possible. Now she means that in an absolute sense. It's just not a nice story. It's not a metaphor. It's just not a nice little something you can get your mind around. No, she says it is the closest relationship possible. Think maybe Siamese twin. Uh, that's just not twins. <laughs> They're still connected. All right. By the closest relationship possible, fiber by fiber, vein by vein, the twig holds fast to the life-giving vine until the life of the vine becomes the life of the branch. And it produces fruit. Uh, fruit. What good is a tree for anything other than shade if it doesn't have fruit? And you know, Jesus said about trees that all they do is give shade. That's good, but it's not good for what he made trees for, really. <clears throat> it says that, 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 that fruit tree that doesn't give any kind of fruit is taking the place of a tree that could. So it's just in the way. <laughs> Get rid of it. <laughs> All right. Christ gave his disciples to understand that the washing of their feet did not cleanse away their sin. So we have all heard somebody somewhere saying, oh, it's a mini baptism. No, no. They're, they're taking the washing to mean the same thing that baptism does. No, that's not what it's for. That's not what it's for. Jesus was telling the disciples, and he proved it by doing something very important. I'll, I'll get ahead of myself here a little bit. There were 12 men there, and one of them was a devil. And all of them weren't acting very well. They kind of were sitting around. They knew the feet had to be washed. <laughs> that was part of the customs of the country. You, you just Somebody washed the feet of the people. But nobody was doing it. And Jesus was waiting for them. But nobody there. <laughs> so finally he got them. And we know... He girded himself. That means he pulled off his robe. He got himself ready to work. And they watched him and said, uh-oh. And I don't know what kind of a picture you have of it, but there was a table, and all the, the places around the table were couches because the people in those days didn't have chairs like this to sit on. They all laid down on the couch on their left arm, and they ate with their right, with their feet sticking outside. So they're all laying around the table. And so he got up. He got some a basin and some water and towels, and he he started in. They're all pulling their feet in. <laughs> Especially Peter. He said, "No, no, no! You're not going to wash my feet. You're not going to do it." And so Jesus says, well, if I don't wash your feet, then we don't have any part with each other. Oh, okay. Wash my hands and my face and my wife. He said, no, you just, just need your feet. But all of you are not clean. Now we're back to the devil. See? And this, this is the part of the story we need to start with net. He washed Judas' feet first. So he went to the worst sinner 
and washed his feet. Now, here's the question I want to ask you. When Jesus washed Judas' feet, did that cleanse him of sin? The foot washing is not for the cleansing of sin. Because it did not cleanse Judas. If you came here to get clean, I'm sorry. It's not going to happen. Because there are a lot of people that say, well, I'll sin until the next communion, and then I'll get clean again. No, 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 no. It doesn't work that way. So now we know. Communion service is not to get clean. So what's it for? That's what we want to know. All right. The cleansing of the heart was tested. <laughs> In this humble service. So we are to come with a clean heart before we take the communion. We must have a clean heart. But getting your feet washed does not make it clean. So let's work with this. Let's see what Ellen White is telling us. If the heart was cleansed, this act of washing feet was all that was essential to reveal the fact. So there's something about foot washing that shows you have a clean heart. That's why we're here. It's not to get a clean heart, but to show we have one. And that makes all the difference in the world how we're going to look at this. Because if we know that, there are a couple other really important things going on in the communion service that start to make sense. Let's continue here. Uh, he said, you are not all clean. And she talks about Judas there. Judas brought a traitor's heart to the scene. And so when Jesus washed Judas' feet, she says, not, it's not an ordinance to cleanse the soul from its moral defilement. Because Jesus washed Judas' feet and it didn't help him one bit. It should have. It should have brought him to repentance. And he did. There was something in his heart. A thrill was in his whole being to have Jesus wash his feet. And he, if we're just a, a moment, said, man... <laughs> I'm in tough shape here, but it didn't take, it didn't hold, and he went ahead. Okay, Jesus would give convincing proof he understood perfectly the character of Judas, that he had not withheld his ministry, even from him. And there's another little lesson here. We must never tell a person they cannot participate in foot washing and the ordinance of the bread and wine. When a person comes and they want to participate, we leave it with them and God. And if they're not worthy, God will take care of it. It's not for us to judge anybody or to say, no, no, you can't do this. Okay, so let's continue with, with uh, what Ellen White is doing with this. It says, infinite love could do no more to bring Judas to repentance and save him from his fatal state. Jesus was loving him right to that moment where, where Judas could not be changed anymore. He was loving him all the way. He was trying to bring him across, and washing his feet was the, the, the last big thing he could do for him to bring him across. He made him the honored guest. All right, so it says, if this service of the master in humbling himself to wash the feet of the worst sinner, and those are Ellen White's words, the worst sinner, if that didn't break his heart, what more could be done? It was the last act of love that Jesus could evidence in behalf of Judas. Infinite love could not compel Judas to repent or to confess. God won't do that. 
He will not force us to be sorry. He won't do that. He will not make us confess. It's strictly up to us. Every opportunity was granted, granted him. So now let's focus on the foot washing a little bit. The next thing that uh, uh, is recorded for us here, it says the ordinance of feet washing is an ordinance of service. Service. This is the lesson the Lord would have us learn and practice. So what, what is this word service? You see, when, when people are told that a Christian serves Christ, they think going to church is serving Christ. That's not service. They're, they're, they're going to have fellowship. But do they really have fellowship? Fellowship is with people that we can see. So here's the, here's the idea. When this ordinance is rightly celebrated, the children of God are brought into holy relationship with each other. And what is holy relationship? To help and to bless one another. To help and to bless. This is telling us what a Christian is. This communion service is trying to teach us in a very practical way what a Christian is, not just in that service, but all the time. We are here in this world now after becoming Christians to help each other, to bless each other, and not just Christians. We're here to help people, period. We're here to bless people. There are many other things we could look at about. In one place, I forget where it is right now, but she talks about sunbeams. She talks about the rays of light that come from the throne of God. We are the rays of light to people. We are to be sunbeams to people, to bring them happiness, cheer, to bring them encouragement. We're a sunbeam to them. <laughs> They're supposed to see something in us they don't see all the time. They're to feel respect. They're supposed to know. They're, they're a worthy person through Christ, even if they're not Christians yet. But we are to be sunbeams because we are in service to God. All right, let's continue here. What we're talking about here is the opposite of selfishness, living for self. There's two opposite things. Okay, so Christ has set us the example, and she says, one equal with God washed the feet of his disciples. One equal with God. And of course we know that he became equal because he was the Father's Son. And he inherited all the attributes of the Father. So they're equal. They're both divine. And the fact that Jesus came second can't possibly make him inferior. That's not possible. Because a God cannot be inferior to a God no matter who came when. A God is 100%, and you can't get more than that. Okay, so try to help people pass that. Almost everybody I've ever talked to thinks that if Jesus came after the Father, that makes him inferior. Of course not. The timing, it doesn't matter. They both are the same. They're of the same kind. So there's no inferiority. So Ellen White understands this clearly. She says, one equal with God got down and washed the feet of his disciples. And here they all wanted to be big shots. And the real big shot got down and washed their feet. Christ is an example of what we, through his grace, are to be. Now, 
Who am I better than? Nobody. We are to esteem others better than we esteem ourselves. See, most people distort that. They make that sentence say something else, but that's what it's saying, that we are to esteem others. We don't think about ourselves first. We think about them first. We think about them better than we think about ourselves. We don't put ourselves first. So service is to bless and to help. And it says it shows that the entire life should be one of humble, faithful ministry. So that's what the, the service is about. That's what it's trying to teach us. That every moment of our life, every day, all the time, we're supposed to be the way we are when we're down on our knees washing somebody's feet. <laughs> all the time. And when somebody's out there and need help and they say something and that makes us grouchy, that's not being on your feet, down there washing their feet. <laughs> you want to be in control and you don't like being put in the situation you're in where you're not being respected or whatever. <laughs> so this is a big service. And the Sunday keeping world knows nothing about it. They don't do it. They don't know. It. This is what God requires of Christians. And most of us have not figured it out yet. But this is real Seventh-day Adventism. This is the real thing. And it's not theological. It's the spirit, the real spirit of the Father and the Son. Okay. It says the ordinance of feet washing most forcibly illustrates the necessity of true humility. And so while they were all grumbling and saying who's going to be the best ones, who's going to sit closest to Jesus when he becomes the king, while well, they were all like that, he took the, the towel and the basin, he went around and started washing their feet. And so they could say, Lord, Lord. He was the pure spotless lamb. But that Lord became their servant. And it was real. It was actual. He became their servant. Now, I'm going to read something that she says every time she discusses this new ordinance, the Last Supper, the Lord's Supper. She does this every time. You look for it whenever you're studying this subject because some people have missed this. She says at this point, He now ate the Passover with his disciples. He put an end to the sacrifices which were... 4,000 years had been offered in the place of the national festival which the Jewish people had observed. He instituted a memorial service in the ceremony of feet washing and the sacramental supper to be observed by his followers through all time in every age. So what did he put to an end? The rites and the ceremonies of the Jews. There are people today who are trying to go back to them. I've seen some websites where the first page says they want to return to those rites. And of course they're not going to go around killing lambs. Nobody's going to do that. Killing bulls. But they're still trying to get back to the types of and they have all kinds of excuses of why they can do some and not others. It's just an interesting thing. Ellen White never talks that way. We need to read her carefully. She says, in the place of the national festival, which the Jewish people have observed, foot washing and the sacramental supper. In other places, she includes everything that was part of the Jewish rites. All right, let's continue. It says, uh, 
they sh should ever repeat Christ's act that all may see that true service called for unselfish ministry. By taking part in the ordinance of feet washing, we show that we are willing to perform this act of humility. We are doing the very thing Christ did, but this is not a humiliation. It's an act which symbolizes the condition of the mind and the heart. So, if it does not bother us in the slightest bit to acknowledge that Jesus has said, I want you to wash each other's feet. Yes, Lord, it's not a problem to me. I don't deserve anything more than being a servant. Anyhow, it's no big deal. <laughs> I'm happy to obey you. And we get down and wash somebody's feet. It's like we're touching Jesus' feet. Because he says, I've given you an example. I've done it. Now you do it to me through that person. And that's, for some reason, that personally has never bothered me because that's logical. I mean, if Jesus did it, sure. Who am I? <laughs> I'm a servant anyhow. <laughs> I can wash his feet. But it has always bothered me to have somebody wash my feet. That, to me, is not logical. <laughs> it doesn't fit. It feels like Jesus is washing my feet and like, like the apostles, I want to pull them in. <laughs> but, but that's the way it is. We have to take the whole thing, each other. And so that brings us to a new thing here. Jesus says, all ye are brethren. And there's something big in that. We have never talked about that in any of our meetings yet. All ye are brethren. We have said some clues. This is literal. I don't know why people get the idea that they are unique. They're not like anybody else. Because we're all the same. Because we, we all came from the same place. Literally, we all go back to Adam. We are actually connected to him. To Adam and Eve, there's just no escape from it. Every human gets back there. So we are literally all related to each other. <laughs> We're all the same thing. So Jesus says, all your brethren, he's not saying anything new. He's, he's trying to get us to understand it. All your brethren. <laughs> so now let's see what Alan White makes out of that. As brethren... We are identified with Christ and with one another because Jesus became a human. He took a human form. Now, he didn't get it from, from Adam, his whole form. He, his father was God. But he did get humanity through Jesus, through Mary. So that there's an element of Jesus and his humanity where he goes all the way back to Adam. Some people don't understand that. But he identifies himself with the whole human race. So we're, he identifies himself with us and we are identified with him. She goes one step further. She says point blank, uh, we, when we wash the feet of Christ's followers, it's as though we're indeed touching the Son of God. We do this act because Christ told us to do it, and Christ himself is among us. His Holy Spirit, there it is. It's always there, isn't it? His Holy Spirit does the work of uniting our hearts. So, there is something very powerful in the communion service. We not only think about these things and recognize them and our own heart is responding in a certain way to show that we have this experience so that we can commune with him in the symbols. But the fact is, he is here with us to make it work. So it's not just us in our minds doing something. He is here. 
And there's something that happens. While we know he is here by his spirit, that brings us together in a way that's even beyond what we normally have with each other. And we in this group here know what that communion is because there's no one here who ever comes to these meetings with the idea, I'm going to destroy that meeting today. I'm going to get into things nobody can deal with. I'm going to show I know that nobody comes here like that. <laughs> we come here to share in the spirit of Jesus the way he wants us to do it. And, and we leave these meetings knowing we have been in touch with God. We all of us do that every week. If you notice when you leave, you, you float out of here. You don't you just walk. <laughs> okay? And the first person you know, or rather that you meet out there, gets the advantage of your experience because all you have for them is love. I don't care who you talk to or who you meet. You love them because you have been with the brethren in that love place. <laughs> okay. These are things I know because we all experience them. All right. So his Holy Spirit does that work of uniting our hearts. And uh, he brings us into self-denial and self-sacrifice. Now, I want to read another note here. She says, the noble principles of the soul are strengthened on every such occasion. Christ lives in us. You cannot put a third God in that sentence. You cannot put a Trinity idea in that sentence. Because the Trinity is not in the Bible or the spirit of prophecy. And if we're paying attention, we'll see it every time we read something that Ellen White writes. Because she never, never moves away from the true God and his son. Never. All right. So it says this draws heart to heart. To be kind, tender, courteous, and daily service. Having hearts that can feel another's woe. So the communion service is a big deal. Jesus gave us, in his last, one of his last acts on this earth, he gave us what we needed to be Christians is to stay Christians. He gave us that service. He says, as often as you do this, you show my death till I come back again. So it's very important. In this ordinance, and here she goes again, in, in this ordinance, Christ, discharged his disciples from the cares and the burdens of the ancient Jewish obligations in rites and ceremonies. This part of the reason he gave these ordinances to, to take them away from the Jewish way of doing things. We're now going to do things in a very direct way with the Father through the Son. We don't need all those types anymore. He came. And he did what he came for. He died. The Son of God died. It was not just a human. It was the Son of God. And now the Jewish system, as important as it was before Jesus came, it no longer means anything because now the types have been fulfilled by the antitypes. He gave this simple ordinance that it might be a special season when he himself would always be present. And so we can count on that as we, we partake of the symbols. We can know at that precise moment he is here by his spirit present with us doing what he does at every communion service. He will take charge to put our minds and our hearts in the proper place to commune with him and with each other. And we will all sense that it's happening to each one of us at the same time. And it's really bringing things together. Okay? Now, here's the part I think we need to understand a little more clearly. He wants us 
to understand our own conscience. He wants us to be awakened to the understanding of the symbols. But taking it in means, taking it all in, the bread, the, the, the grape juice, taking it in. That's, that's what he meant by here, eat. Take it in. Take it all in. You can't get enough. Take it in. And then it says to revive their memory to convict of sin. Is that something the Holy Spirit does in the Bible? To convict of sin? It's Jesus himself doing it. It's right here. To convict of sin and to receive their penitential repentance. So we can know we are fully accepted with Jesus right here on the spot in true communion because he has received our sorrow for sin and our turning away from it. He has received it from us. So the communion is a supernatural thing that's happening. It's a genuine communion. She is talking now about the moral and spiritual nature that we have that needs this. She says, Then it was Christ's desire to leave to his disciples an ordinance that would do for them the very thing they needed that would serve to disentangle them from the rights and the ceremonies which they had hitherto engaged in as essential, and which the reception of the gospel made of no longer any force. Now, I don't know how it can be said more plainly that we're to leave what the Jews had alone. It's not for us. We're not to be entangled with that. But there are people everywhere in the Seventh-day Adventist environment trying to get back to, to the things that Moses gave to the Jews as a nation. All right, we'll not get any further into that. We know she said it. We ought to leave it where she said it and not try to make excuses to go ahead and do it anyhow. So Jesus then said to love one another that's what this communion service is about. Love one another as I have loved you. Now, how could they do that? They didn't know yet how he loved them. He has not been to the cross yet. <laughs> so they had to wonder, what does he mean? But he has been to the cross for us. We know what he did. And we know what he meant. Love each other as I have loved you. Now, are we ready to do that? That's the question. What did he do? He said, there's nothing I won't do to get you saved. That's the way it's supposed to be with each other. There's nothing I won't do. Nothing that's too big. Nothing that's too expensive to give away. Nothing, anything. To be sure that I've done what I need to do to help you be saved. Including dying. Now, I think we need to decide that one. That one doesn't happen by itself. There's nothing automatic about it. We have to decide it. We have to think about it. How is it important to me to have people saved? How important is it? What am I willing to pay? What am I willing to give? We need to decide it. Because there are things going to come up where there's a price to pay. <laughs> it always comes up. And in that moment, we will either say, no, no, not me, somebody else. <laughs> or, or I can't do that. I can't lower myself that low. Or whatever. What's the price? They're going to laugh at me. 
Well, is that too big a price to have somebody laugh at you? <laughs> we will come into all of these things. And the communion service is to help us move in the right direction. Get it in your head that washing someone's feet. There's nothing wrong with it. Jesus did it. Jesus did it. You can do it. No problem. Just get used to doing it all the time. <laughs> all the time. So they had a new conception of love to work with. That love starts with self-sacrifice. They were to show forth the love abiding in their hearts for men, women, children by doing all in their power for their salvation. But they were to reveal a special tender love for all of the same faith. And there is something special about the household of God that people know when they're there. And we have a very special opportunity with each other and privilege of being with people that believe the same way we believe. You can't walk into an average church and say, we all know the same thing, we all love the same way, we all, that doesn't happen. Because no... No church is made up of people who all agree on everything. So it's a special privilege to be with people who agree with you in the important things. We don't need to look for little minor things that we don't understand exactly the same. We all understand the real things, the important things, and that's what holds us together. That's what the disciples were to go out to do. And especially with the church people who love Jesus the same way they did. The soul is fed by the streams of pure love and flow from the heart of Christ. And when that is happening, that is communion. This is because the heart is in love with Jesus. And the first time I saw it in Ellen White, it surprised me. But she was so free with it. She just, like, like it was so natural for her. It was her real life. She says, Jesus, I adore thee. I adore thee. <laughs> she says, we're never supposed to think or say that to any human. But we are to say it to Jesus. Jesus, I adore thee. And I think we're all moving in that direction as we learn what love really is and where it comes from. Okay, I don't want to continue this now. We can still, there's more. There's more to do. You can read uh, the, the rest of this. She finishes, just so you'll know what to look for at the end of this article about the nobility of man and that Jesus came because of our value to him, to God. And we need to think about that more often, that as sinners we're not worth anything, but as the original creation that we were, the purposes of God, we are to be the highest creation that God will ever put together in all eternity. We are above the angels when the plan of salvation is over. We are in the family of God himself. And there is a value to man that none of us have seen. We, we have never understood it. And we, we may not until Jesus comes back. But the communion service is to restore that nobility of man in each other's so we love and respect each other and know this is a real being that I'm dealing with here and I'm one of those too. And we are all the family of God. So let's move into the actual communion service now.